Hello, my name is Sean O'Donoghue. I am a researcher at the Garvin Institute and also affiliated with UNSW and CSRO, uh, all organizations uh, based in Sydney, Australia. Uh, and I'm very excited to share with you today our work on systematic modeling of SARS-CoV-2 protein structures as part of an international uh, team. And I'm just going to talk briefly about our strategy of modeling, a little bit about the data we found, and uh, mostly about how we've been uh, working to create a visual framework to make these data easily accessible and usable, and particularly so that they uh, enable researchers to use these data to, uh, to derive uh, new insight into COVID infection mechanisms. And I'm going to finish with a few words about uh, how potentially some of the approaches we're taking here could help accelerate uh, COVID research uh, worldwide. So our study began with uh, 14 uh, Uniprot protein sequences, and we then systematically matched all of those sequences to every available uh, three-dimensional structure, about 170,000 across all organisms. This generated about 900 sequence structure alignments, uh, giving us about 900 uh, structural templates. And um, this gives us a wealth of detailed information about molecular mechanisms, and it compares favorably to uh, related resources. But it gives us a new problem, which is how do we make nearly a thousand structures accessible and usable to people? So I'm going to, in the next few slides, step through the strategies that we developed to, uh, to uh, we hope, achieve that. And we'll start by looking at uh, one of the proteins, uh, NSP3. And essentially what our approach is doing is we're finding regions that match to structures. So we find, for example, in this protein, a region called the macro domain that has 144 structures. Um, and uh, some of those structures actually match identically to the sequence in that region. Um, that's, these are recently solved structures, but most of them actually look more like this. They're the structure of viral proteins from related viruses, sometimes very distantly related viruses. This is getting a little distant. And to warn you that this might happen, every time a residue in the structure is different from the COVID sequence, we indicate that with a black mark on that residue. Uh, so it gives you a quick pre-attentive uh, instinct that something's going wrong. But to have a summary structure, we choose sort of the best one for each, uh, each of these clusters, each of these regions, um, as a representative image. And actually, for the macro domain, uh, amongst the 144 matches, there's some that match to host proteins, um, including human proteins. And so whenever that happens, uh, we uh, draw a graph connected to that region and indicate the human proteins that are being matched. And so a way to interpret this graph is to say that the macro domain um, may mimic um, each of these proteins. And um, so and in addition to the macro domain, there's several other domains uh, or regions of this protein where we have structural matches. So we have, in fact, uh, look over here, there's, there's 38 uh, structures matching to the PL pro domain. And this domain also has something interesting going on. Uh, in this case, all 38 match to viral proteins, but in many of those structures, uh, there's also a human protein um, in, in the same structure, so we're seeing a dire, uh, direct structural evidence of uh, a connection. So we call this a, a potential hijacking of a human uh, protein by, uh, by, by the peel pro domain. And note that there's these two different mechanisms, the mimicking and the hijacking, are uh, indicated with different uh, visual, um, uh, visual, visual channels. And um, in addition, there's still these regions where we don't have any structure information. And it's a stronger statement than we just don't know the structure. Because of the systematic modeling, we know that those regions aren't detectably similar in sequence to anything that we've ever solved the structure of. So these are truly unknown structures, and we call them dark regions. If we step back now and look at the whole proteome, all 14 proteins in COVID, um, we can see the dark regions uh, account for maybe one third of the, uh, of the proteome. Um, and um, this map is actually quite useful in that it summarizes everything that we know structurally about COVID or anything like COVID. It also uh, summarizes all of these potential hijacking and, and, um, and mimicry of human proteins, um, as well as the coverage and so forth. So um, you can see it as a static visualization, as, as a figure, um, but um, we've also uh, developed a version of this online. Um, that you can use for intra for um, intra yeah, for um, navigation. So let's zoom down to the spike glycoprotein, 121 structures, and uh, 16 of them, as we see, are hijacking ACE2 quite quite famously. So if we click on um, that, that'll take us to uh, the structure of one of the ACE2 receptors. We can also get to all the others there. Um, in this view, what we do is we highlight one chain of the spike glycoprotein 
kind of hide everything else. We see immediately the black marks there. That's that's because this is not the structure of um, spike glycoprotein. It's the structure of something else. Um, actually, it's the structure of a SARS-related um, protein. Um, and um, so if you want to see everything in the structure, just double click in the background, uh, and then you can see kind of all the chains. If you want to switch back to the other, to the, the first view, just double click again on any chain, and that'll center the rotation and, and the view on that, on that chain. Um, this region down here shows us uh, the different structures and where they match to the sequence. And in particular of interest is, is, is that we have 34 structures that match to most of the sequence of the spike like a protein. Uh, the top three ranked structures are trimers. And uh, one of the ones we're seeing here is a trimer of, uh, of the spike like a protein plus ACE2 receptor. And note that there's actually no single structure that matches to uh, the complete sequence. Uh, which is very typical for most proteins. Um, we also have a feature tab where we can uh, cast onto the structure uh, sequence features. So for example, these are Uniprot domain annotations that can help us interpret and use the structure information. Um, and if you're interested in uh, domains, uh, it's very useful also to check out the CAF uh, feature set. This gives you not only uh, more features, but actually more information about every feature uh, using these nice interactive uh, graphics um, as well. Um, and aside from CATH, we've also got a, a third uh, or several resources, but another one called Predict Protein. Um, this uh, has uh, mostly predicted features of protein sequences. Uh, and, and let's just focus in here on the conservation scores. It's quite nice here how we see um, that the central core region of the spike like a protein, which we know is, uh, is in fact conserved sequence wise, um, and the region that is in direct contact with the ACE2 receptor has the, the lowest uh, conservation, as, as we'd expect. So it's not a surprise, but it's good to see that there's a confirmation there. Um, so let's go back to the, the overview map and look at the mid-region briefly. So here we see uh, there's several cases where interesting things are going on. The NSP13 protein, for example, has a number of uh, potential mimics. And in particular, we'll look at the AQR gene, the protein encoded by that. There's 11 structures of that protein, and 10 of them have a complete spliceosome in the structural complex. So we've gone to one of them. Spliceosome is a quite a large complex, um, and this is where the, the default view of a query kind of really starts to make sense because uh, it can be difficult to sort of navigate your way through the complex, but a query immediately sort of narrows you into the AQR protein, and then in color you see the region of that protein that matches to the uh, to the COVID uh, uh, proteome. So the region that it's potentially mimicking is just that tiny part there. Um, and that actually tells us uh, uh, a few, several things uh, right off the bat. One is that um, if we look at the region of uh, the contact between AQR and the spliceosome, you see it's all in regions that don't match to the viral proteome. So that means that um, probably the virus doesn't directly contact the spliceosome, the rest of the spliceosome. But what it might do is it might uh, mimic that the f function, get in first, if you like. Um, and the function of this uh, protein, it's implicated in um, exon ligation. And uh, there's some interesting new evidence that's just recently emerging that uh, several viruses have the ability to actually create chimeric proteins, uh, viral together with host proteins. And this uh, might be some supporting evidence uh, for that. And it seems to be a new observation. And let's return now to the top of the graph we cited first. This is an NSP3 protein we looked at at the very beginning, uh, the macro domain. And now uh, an interactive version, we can go and click on one of these nodes. Let's, let's click on the macro H2A1. Um, and of the seven structures that show the, mac the viral macro domain mimicking that, uh, we've gone to one of them. So this is a human protein structure uh, with the viral se sequence uh, mapped onto it. Um, we can also go to the human protein and this changes the view. Instead of looking at the viral sequence now, we're looking at the human uh, sequence, and we can sort of learn a bit about how it functions. There's the macro domain of the C terminus, and uh, there's a sort of a linker region where, again, we don't have any structure, um, but there's a region here at in, uh, the end terminus that's quite famous. Uh, any molecular biologist will recognize the next image uh, uh, pretty much immediately. So this is one of the core histone proteins in, in humans. Um, and the macro domain sort of sits outside and is a sensor for proteins that have been post-translation modified with ADP robosylation. And they send a signal in that might, may influence uh, the epigenomic state of our genome. So this actually uh, appears to be a new observation uh, of a connection between um, 
of coronaviruses and um, epigenomic uh, uh, states via this mechanism. In fact, all of those proteins there are associated with uh, ADP robustulation, which is uh, quite interesting. So I'd encourage you to check out the resource online. And as mentioned, I'm just going to finish up with a few words about uh, how approaches like this could potentially help accelerate research. And I, I think the one thing I would c comment on is that um, if, if, if the resources that we're currently assembling to tackle the, the problem of COVID research, um, it, of course, it's hard enough just to get all the data right. Um, this is a big struggle. Um, but we really have to push ourselves to start integrating these data uh, in ways that are intuitive to, um, to the, the uh, normal molecular biologist. Um, most people are not going to, uh, unfortunately, uh, have the, the time or the um, the, um, the, the skills required to sort of mine uh, data from databases. Um, so I, I think we need to invest uh, in this uh, much more than we are currently doing. Those of you who are interested, we've, uh, together with colleagues, I've been running an initiative called the VISB conference series. We've got some uh, resources online that might be of interest. Um, and we're actually just announcing that we're uh, setting up a, a discussion forum, uh, specifically asking this question, how can data viz help accelerate uh, COVID research? So that basically that concludes um, the points I wanted to cover. So all that remains for me now is to um, thank the organizers for the opportunity to present this work um, and also thank obviously our funding agencies and employers and particularly for me to thank the team who've worked so diligently over the last uh, five months to put all this together. Um, and uh, with that, I'll um, invite you to get in contact either now or by any of the means uh, shown here. Thank you for your time.